all right welcome again to the second day and uh, sorry for yesterday's interruption but uh, i figured out how to do it not why it happened but how to do it okay so yesterday this is where we had stopped we were talking about two events a and b and uh, uh, our stopping point was that we, uh, this uh, is defined def taken as definition of a give probability of a given b uh, the probability of joint event divided by probability of uh, the conditioning event whatever we have observed is called conditioning event and uh, one can justify it by applying it to simple scenarios and justify ourselves that yeah this is exactly what we want and then we take it to more general scenario okay so that's where we were yesterday uh, now let's come to uh, uh, this was about conditional probability now we can come to what is called conditional expectation suppose you have a random variable x and uh, it's integrable so summation of those probabilities is finite summation of uh, <coughs> weighted averages is finite now because this was our definition of expectation summation over x times probability capital x equal to x so this is the weighted average weight is x and these are the probabilities now if you take the weighted average of the conditional probabilities that uh, makes sense to call it conditional expectation so uh, if you have observed an event, uh, then uh, this will be your new expected value of whatever is your reward. Okay, and this is simply an expectation with conditional probabilities instead of probabilities. There is no deviation. It's, it has all the properties like uh, absolute values and so on. What we have taken, it will work. Now, suppose you have two random variables, and what we are observing is an event based on a random variable. So it's not just whether b happened yes or no but what is the value of y which happened okay suppose you observed a random variable y then uh, uh, the same definition that we gave above uh, here it was given a way b even b instead of that the event b is now capital y equal to small y and the same definition we can give and then since this conditional expectation is similar exactly expectation with respect to this conditional probabilities the Jensen's inequality will also hold. Uh, we will not spend time on that, but this is easy enough calculation. As I said, finite dimensional uh, is algebra, otherwise uh, uh, analysis simple. Now, here is the important uh, screen. That is, we define this definition, conditional expectation of x given capital Y equal to Y. And whatever summation we get, it's actually a random value. Uh, it's, it's, we can think about it as conditional expectation of x given y is random variable z which is depends on y and when y is observed as little y then here is the value so we can think about it as a uh, let's say uh, uh, in the stock market uh, the uh, the boss gives an instruction to his uh, uh, people who are going to be on the floor in the old days now they are doing it online that if let's say y is infosys x is uh, tcs so if y the infosys stock moves to such and such value here is the expected value of x and now you do what you want to do so in order to implement that you have to make a table as to for every value of y we can write down what will be the expected value of x so in other words you will get a function of y okay so that is what it is this g of little y is conditional expectation of x given that capital y is small y you compile it as a function and then we say that uh, conditional expectation of random variable x given random variable y is z where z is a function of y and that function can be computed by this nice formula okay so uh, <clears throat> any kind of policies definitions uh, that you want to give uh, we can give in terms of conditioning because when it comes to conditional expectation because when it gets time to implement something you would have observed some things and you can plug in those values of what you have observed in a function to compute what should be your expected value okay so uh, important conditional expectation of a random variable x given another random variable y is itself a random variable and that random variable is function of the observed random variable y and that function is defined by this one okay. and 
in all that we talked uh, y need not have been a real value whatever we talked will also work if y was uh, <coughs> taking values in d dimensional vector space or if y is a vector uh, y is uh, your random variables x and y1 y2 ym then expectation value of x given y1 y2 ym is a function of the observed variables and what function that function is now worked out here okay so uh, uh, it's simple enough i uh, think uh, and now uh, i'm just showing them i'm not going to even read them uh, to uh, avoid time but uh, basically linear all the properties that we work with expectations work with conditional expectations so linearity works monotonicity works here is a interesting observation that if you are interested in conditional expectation of y given y uh, u given y1 y2 yk we can first take condition with respect to y1 y2 yk plus 1 and then take another expectation given y1 y2 yk and best way to think about it is if we have a point in a three dimensional space and you want its uh, projection onto x axis first we can take its projection on uh, the uh, uh, the uh, x and y axis together uh, the plane containing x and y axis together and then take from there you take a further uh, 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 <coughs> projection onto the x axis the same you will get the same answer so in a certain sense uh, this is the same business that uh, you first take a conditional expectation with respect to assume if you had a few more variables available it will be a function of whatever you are conditioning with it will include what y1 y2 yk now you take conditional expectation with respect to y1 y2 yk and especially in finite spaces all these are simple uh, algebra we can verify this expect this value via algebra okay. and why i only given one more you can given many more also the same thing works expectation of y u given y1 y2 yk yk plus 1 up to ym and then y1 to yk is same as expectation u given y1 to yk so instead of r r r2 r3 we can do r rk and rk plus m same thing will work so uh, the, the I've glossed over a few slides. These are some algebraic properties of these conditional expectations. You can go over when you see the, uh, have the presentation along with the videos later. But uh, let me focus on this interesting uh, thing now. Let's consider a gambling house where n games are going to be played sequentially. So earlier thing, there were two coins, uh, uh, two dice were being tossed at the same time. Now there is a game which will be played sequentially. Same game, different game, doesn't matter. Let XK be the net reward for a stake of rupee 1 for the kth game. If somebody bids 1 rupee on the kth game, they will reward his XK. And let's say it's a fair game. Expectation XK is 0. Rare to find, but suppose it is so. Now question is, is it possible for a gambler to tweak the system by choosing a1, a2, an such that by betting an amount ak on the kth game, the gambler can turn the game in her favor. Okay. So, uh, this question uh, was uh, occupying the probabilists who are associated with gambling and probability modeling in the 16th, 17th centuries. That uh, so there's something called the Petersburg uh, uh, game where uh, you, uh, you sequentially it is going to be played and you bet one rupee and you may win or you may lose half of probability. If you lose, next time you pay uh, uh, bid again and now you bet two rupees. And uh, each time you, if you win, you will get twice that, and if you add it up, eventually you would have won one rupee and uh, if you continue to lose each time you double your stake and keep playing and uh, then there is a debate whether effectively this is a sure strategy of sure win or is there something else okay and more about this question in a few minutes later but uh, so the point is if 
if the time amounts you have to bet are deterministic numbers constants then we can see that the expected value of uh, sn will be summation ak expected value of xk which will be zero so on the average anyway you are going to lose now the question is uh, if aks are uh, allowed to depend on the history so while betting at the kth time because it is sequential you would have observed a1 a2 ak minus 1 xk x1 x2 xk minus 1 you utilize this information to bid kth game like in my betting thing which i told you if you have already won you don't you can stop playing you are not going to play and if you keep losing if each of x1 x2 xk minus 1 is uh, 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 zeros then the kth game you bet 2 power k your ak will be 2 power k if x1 x2 up to xk minus 1 is 0 and 1 uh, 2 power k if uh, uh, yeah. so then uh, the you will uh, get eventually that uh, you will win 1 but there is a catch to this uh, there is a, a small let's say you walk in with some uh, 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 money in your pocket total uh, uh, money you have if you have if two if you lose first k games where 2 power k is bigger than the money you have got you can't now bet 2 power k and you will be thrown out by the gambling house so uh, therefore there was debate whether this gives you a sure way of winning or not etc what how does one interpret it okay now to be uh, what kind of things can go wrong uh, let's see uh, even in finite time so this was a thing going to infinite time so suppose you are only you are not going to keep playing you suppose only two games or ten games then what happens so let's say fair coin coin is going to be tossed twice a gambler has a choice of betting in two games bet one uh, thousand on first game gives sixteen hundred if the first toss is edge and uh, yield zero if the first toss is a loss okay uh, and uh, on the game two the bet of thousand on the second game gives uh, uh, the 1800, 350 or 1450 depending on these four outcomes and now I have drawn it as a uh, <coughs> graph okay. so this is the first one uh, and these are the outcomes of the second class okay so 1800, 150, 1450 now the expected return for the first game is 850 this times half plus this times half and we can compute expected return for the second game and we will see it is 900. So it is both are less than 1000 and therefore our law of large numbers will give that if large number of people play this game, the gambling house is going to make money. Now, novelty of the game designed by an expert was lost after some time and casino owner tried to entice more people by making it more interesting. So the game show host asked people to bet without deciding if it is for game 1 or game 2. Namely, you start playing. After game 1, if you don't feel like you can exit, if you feel like you can continue to game 2. Okay. Now, uh, let's do, if it's a smart uh, <coughs> gambler, he or she will do the following. Suppose first round you win, he or she wins, they are here. Now they have to choose not the originally what they had bet 1000, that has already gone up to 1600. Now they have to decide whether or to not continue to play the game. 1600 if you, you again get an edge, you will get to 1800, but if next one is a T, it will come down to 100. So the expected return after the second game here is 950. So you have 1600 in hand, whereas expected return after second game will be 950. So why would you play? Whereas on the other hand here, 100 can go down to 50, but it can go up to 1450 with probability half half. So it will go up to 750. So you have you have lost it, but you have chance of making it up somewhat. You initially started with 1000. It has down to 100, but you can uh, get something at least if you play one more round. And so a smart investor uh, will 
quit if he or she reaches 100 and will continue to play if uh, he or she uh, reaches uh, T and then the final uh, rewards will be these three green things. So 1600 with probability half, 50 with probability half, 1450 with probability half and you get that the net reward becomes 1175. So what was a fair game which was in favor of the gambling house as soon as players were allowed to decide to stop or play after first round, uh, the game changed its hand and it became uh, favorable to the player. So whenever one of the two sides has an option how long to play, okay, uh, the overall analysis changes. And uh, a brief uh, for a uh, you know, these days, uh, for years now, if somebody, own, go, uh, somebody wants to buy a house and goes to bank for a house loan, several banks give a choice. You can choose for a, a fixed uh, rate of interest or variable rate of interest. So fixed rate of interest you have for some number of years, mm, uh, then uh, it has one rate and if you say variable, then it has another rate. And most banks have this law that uh, if you uh, turn, if you have made enough money otherwise and you want to pay off all your loan more, much earlier than the promised period, then there is a kind of a penalty. And uh, various people did not understand that, you know, if I have taken a loan, suppose I take a loan at 10, uh, 10 uh, interest rate of 10 percent and uh, after three years, I have taken the loan for 10 years. After three years, uh, I somehow see that the interest rate has dropped in the market. So I can borrow a 8% loan from some other bank and return this, uh, this bank's loan right away so that I have reduced my uh, <coughs> payoff to the bank. In other words, by switching it from one bank to the other, I am able to simulate or to, to redo the game one, game two scenario where I am able to choose how long to take this loan for depending on how the interest rates are growing in the market. On the other hand, if the market interest rate goes up, then uh, I need not uh, do this. So if the uh, borrower is allowed to pay back the loan ahead of time of the initial uh, plan, uh, the bank charges an extra interest. and. Uh, th 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 there is a lot of literature on this, even uh, some people have gone to the court and court has overruled that how can you charge a penalty for paying back your loan. The courts did not understand the strategic uh, far part of this. So now what banks do is they put the whatever penalty they would have imposed, they already put it into their interest rate. They have raised the interest rates because they are, they are forced to give the uh, person a choice of paying back early. So uh, maybe I said it a bit too fast and didn't explain it completely, but you can read about it, talk to each other or write to me if you have still question mark about this. I said this, brought this example because it's not only about gambling, it is day to day life, We're dealing with banks, dealing with courts, uh, all this, this what I call strategic decision making or uh, uh, ex uh, <clears throat> sequential decision making. You need not commit it now. You can change your plan as the time goes by. As the time goes by, you hear and learn more things and you can fine tune your strategy based on that. The other side has to be prepared for that. Just like after giving you a six year loan, after one year bank can't say that, sorry, 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 you have to pay back all the money right away. That is not allowed. So bank is forced to give you for a fixed period. Then it is reasonable that bank asks you, to hold the same period and if you repay early, then they may charge a premium for that. Okay. All right. Uh, now coming back to the gambling, if the gambling house would, if the gambling house would like to see that the game remains favorable to the house in spite of 
giving the choice to players it could ensure that at each node the reward at the end a reward at hand is greater than or equal to the expected reward after one more step so the left hand side here is the expected reward but if the player plays one more step and the right hand side is reward at hand you have reached the point sequence of events has been s1 s2 sk the sums at time k this is the reward at hand if you play one more reward at hand is sk plus 1 then they should ensure this of course they have to ensure that overall expected is uh, uh, less than whatever they have charged you to play but once they do that uh, they can be assured that any kind of strategic game you are not going to tweak the uh, house against house so here is a pictorial uh, if you recall the first two things are the same uh, the bottom line what i have rearranged the uh, uh, winnings uh, and now it is done so that here it is 1600 in hand and this is 1575 if one more turn 100 in hand 75 if one more game so this ensures that uh, no matter how the gam uh, strategy uh, a gambler plays as long as you have enticed the person in gambling you are ahead you meaning the gambling house So, uh, if such a thing can be ensured, then the sum of uh, the total net reward at each point that becomes what is called a martingale. So, here is a martingale. This is S zero. S one is sixteen hundred or hundred with probability half half, and H H will correspond to seven. So, this is S two, the total sum. S one, S two, and here this picture is uh, late, less than equal to is. one thing but if it remains equal then it is called a martingale the sequence of rewards is same said to be a martingale if at each step the reward at hand if the player exits at that step equals the expected reward after one more step or uh, writing this we can write uh, uh, as conditional expectation of sn plus 1 given s1 is a1 up to sn is an is an so a1 a2 an are the nodes and it is equal to the last node uh and less than equal to it is called super marking a uh, uh, sub marking a less than equal to this happens it is called super marking a and greater than equal to it happens it is called a sub marking a so there are this sub and super which are each for every n for everywhere it is greater than same inequality holds uh if this is equal to, greater than equal to n for every n it is sub marking a less than equal to this it is super marking a uh now here is the interesting thing now suppose we start with a martingale so net reward uh, at time n for initial bid of 1 and it's a martingale means uh, at each step one step uh, nobody can tweak the game in their favor you play one more step the expected return is same as whatever you already had gained at that point now let us consider a predictable strategy so i have called it the word predictable which is like at time k it's a function of random variables but random variables observed up to but previous round not this round because this strategy you are implementing now before uh, the k game is played so you can have a strategy which uses all the earlier ones but not that one and then if you bid this quantity the reward will be f fk at s1 s2 sk minus 1 times the so you you could have exited with sk minus 1 you chose to continue so your additional will be sk minus sk minus 1 so the net reward for the this strategy so f1 f2 sk all together we can call it as a strategy and this this strategy uh, at time n the reward is zn someone has a question actually uh, let's see if i can see what the is question sn yeah. or random uh, process is, yeah what is the question i can't see is sn or random process 
yeah so uh, this ssr random process uh, and these are uh, let me go back to my uh, yeah so this is s0 okay s1 is 100 with if the first outcome is t it is 100 and is uh, 1600 if the first outcome is h this is s2 if the outcome is hh then it is s2 is 1700 ht it is 1450 H is uh, this should have been uh, pH. pH it is fifty and TT is hundred. So you have some sequence of games which are happening and SK is the net gain at time k. If you start with one uh, at time one with uh, my indexing, this is S one, S two, this is S three. So. So, uh, so S why is it called martingale? Huh? Why, why is it, it called martingale? What okay. is the motivation for the name? The word martingale itself is somehow related to horse racing. Okay. Uh, and therefore, it uh, whoever uh, there, there was a, a mathematician probably is called Ville who called it martingale, and that name has stuck. Other than that, I can't figure out why this name has come, but uh, it seemed an interesting enough name, and that's why it has stuck. Oh, I thought maybe name of a mathematician. I mean, probably a mathematician. It's oh. something to do with horse racing. Ah, okay. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, so once again, see. So another way to think about it is a sequence of rewards: S one, S two, S n. So you have made some initial bid. If you stop after one round, you will get S1. If you stop after K, nth round, you will get Sn. If these rewards are stacked in such a way that at any time, if you decide to play one more round, your expected reward is same as uh, expected reward will change, but expected is same as whatever you have in hand. That is what this is. Expected reward after one more step is same as whatever you have in hand. And uh, so, if it, to begin with, if the only thing which has been allowed is you decide how many games you will play. That means you are committing to a strategy which is you are exiting at a fixed time. And this S1, S2, Sn are already created. Now, if they are arranged in such a way that conditional expectation of Sn plus 1 given S1, S2, Sn is Sn, then the gambling house can give you a strategic game that any time you choose, you want to continue or stop. If you want to stop, I will pay out whatever you, is due to you. Or you play one more round and you will get whatever is next. So if your strategic play is allowed, then your net reward can be uh, listed as this ZN that we have listed here. Corresponding to a strategic game F1, F2, FK, strategic, strategy F1, F2, FK, dot, 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 the reward at time N will be ZN. And then this is a major result from Doob that if to begin with S is a martingale, the reward sequence is a martingale, then any kind of strategic play involving predictable strategies, uh, the expected return will continue to be the same. Uh, here is the theorem. Let f1 be a constant and fk be bounded functions. sk is a martingale. Then zk defined by this is also a martingale. There is another question right now. Yeah. Uh, by a strategic play, if to begin with the game is a martingale, you can't tweak the uh, on the expected value of the game by this. Major result from Do. Uh, so essentially, the martingales were not defined by Do. They were defined by, I guess, uh, Ville and maybe Paul Levy, and they had wrote about it. But uh, Do. It into account and uh, worked out a whole lot of major results about martingales. All the three results we are going to do today are uh, due to do, and they became they are the cornerstone of uh, uh, using martingale theory for anything and everything in probability theory. Okay. So this is the first such result that if to begin with SK is a martingale, uh, namely the expected condition that we wrote down. Uh, 
you tweak the things via uh, strategic uh, uh, multipliers strategy fk which is predictable because at age so if you look at this object fk this you will have to implement this at time k it's a random variable but it's a random variable which is already a constant when you reach that time So uh, therefore, this is a very interesting kind of a so random variable because here you are fixing some sequence of observables with time, and all discussion is based on that sequence of observables, and therefore we can talk about it at time zero, at time zero, or at time one. It may look like a random variable. When the time k comes, you will know what that value is. And if you think about it. Uh, in our real life, also we are used to uh, talk about future times which are not deterministic, but which uh, uh, when the time occurs, everybody will agree that yes, time has happened. It's like you know, uh, for a Zoom session, we can say that as long as as soon as number of uh, participants crosses fifty, we will start the session, or two minutes after that, we will start the session. To begin with. we don't know when that time will be so it's a random variable when are you going to start the session but when 50 people come even if the whoever is going to speak is not realize it somebody can remind me that oh now the participants are 50 now we can start in 2 minutes you should have put it off but yeah so uh this uh <clears throat> Raju, there is a question. Yeah, tell me. If ex, uh, from Durga, if expected yeah. award will remain the same, why will anyone be interested to play? Ah, okay. So this is an idealized game. No gambling house is going to offer this game. Okay. Uh, the uh, the in fact every game uh, always the expected reward is less than what you are supposed to pay. Play. Okay, so the reward. One can question why do people play? Because they somehow think that they can game, they can play a strategy which will surely lead them to victory. Uh, also, you think about the following. Uh, let's say uh, the so-called lottery tickets. When I was a child at school, the lottery tickets used to be one rupee. I don't know what are the lottery tickets today, but let's say which are legally done in India, hundred, thousand. I don't know. Uh, but if you read out how many uh, they are going to sell and what will be the profit, uh, what will be the reward, etc., you can figure out that the expected reward is a minuscule uh, fraction of whatever is the pay that uh, everybody buys the lottery ticket. But still, so many sell. The reason is that people can be willing to lose hundred rupees today if there is a, even a minuscule of chance that they can win a million. Uh, okay, that people will play. so why people play is a very difficult thing to answer okay but uh, so these are idealized uh, we are doing an idealized analysis and uh, while using it you have to use your own judgment of what the framework is okay. i hope i answered the question now the uh, briefly i will go over the proof just two line two three lines here that let's note that the difference in zn zn and the difference in zn will be exactly equal to the what you will get at the nth time fn s1 s2 sn minus 1 times sn minus sn minus 1 now when you take try to do conditional expectation of the of this we will see that uh this will uh Um, I have changed the index n to n plus one here anyway, but doesn't matter. If you try to do conditional expectation after n at time n, if you have observed up to time n, conditional ex expected reward at the next time is equal to what you have at time now plus this expectation, which uh, this being a constant at s n plus one, uh, a function of s n s one s two s n minus one s n. so expected value when you take of the product it the this can be pulled out and correct this should have been sn plus 1 here 
Fn Fn plus one. Okay. So then, when you take conditional expectation Zn plus one given S1 S2 Sn. Uh, Zn, which is already there, will be uh, come out, and conditional expectation of this given the observables, this part will be observed at time uh, n plus one already. So it will be taken out of the expectation, and it will be this. So here we are using something that expected value of uh, some h of y times x given y will be h of y. Times expected value of x given y. So think about it this way: that if you are at at a time when y is already observed, then the function h of y is already you know what its value is. So you don't while taking expected values, you don't need to take it out. You will take it out, and then times uh, expected value x given y. So if expected value of x given y is zero. Expected value of h y times x will also be zero. So therefore, conditional expectation of s n plus one minus s n is zero. So when you multiply it by this, it will still be zero, and you will get this is equal to zero. So uh, if you try to write out these steps involving summations uh, and uh, functions of uh, uh, the observables, you can easily write it out. So Uh, so this transformation, so you had Martingale zeigts, and this you have transformed by multiplying by some constants, and in such a way that these constants are predictable, and you get zn. So this is called a Martingale transform of the Martingale sk. S K is our original martingale, and then we have uh, multiplied by some strategies and uh, multiplied the increments by strategies and taken the sum. Now, as we can see, if you go to a continuous time, this will this is like the sums. This is like the Riemann sums, and in the limit, this will be like an integer. So, the analog of this object in continuous time is what is called the stochastic integral, uh, and uh, again a major part of. Uh, uh, Applying probability to, mar to markets or to various other things, okay. and what I wrote in discrete time, the Dupe's theorem continues to work in continuous time. That if original S K is a martingale, then when you take its stochastic integral with respect to a predictable integrand, the output is still a martingale. But today we are not focusing on that. Uh, the focus here is that. If z is s is a martingale, then z defined by this formula, s is a martingale sequence, then z defined by this formula is also a martingale sequence. That is the main theorem. Okay. Uh, in mathematical finance, when S K denotes the price of a stock, then F K S one S two S K minus one is called a trading strategy. So on kth day, whether you want to buy, sell, how many to buy, how many to sell, of course you can bring in uh, all the happenings of till yesterday and decide based on that you can decide how much to buy or how much to sell. Or you may be controlling the thing. You can tell your people how much to buy or how much to sell. So this is called a trading strategy, and uh, this yields the Value of the net holdings by this strategy. Now, it's clear here that for a trading strategy, one could bring into a, all the other observables and not the only history of SK. So, in other words, if somebody is interested in, uh, let's say, uh, bidding for Tata uh, TCS, okay, and SK is denoting the TCS shares. Now, how much to buy TCS shares? You can depend based on whatever happened in. is a share still yesterday but you can also see what would have what happened in infosys shares what happened in other stock shares or overall what happened in the economy or anything else so you can bring in all the information available till uh, yesterday evening in this decision okay so in other words uh, 
the the strategies need not be only depend on what, what happened or S1 S2 SK, but whatever other variables you think you are going to be able to observe. So that leads to this general framework that you can denote all observables at time k by y k. So it need not be a one a, 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 a real valued function or one, uh, but it could be a multi-dimensional function or whatever you might want. It could be a very generic function of observables. And then you can choose SK whether to include or, and this should include SK, but could include more. And now the trading strategy on kth day could be FK of Y1, Y2, YK minus 1. And the thing would be as long as the stock market is a martingale with respect to these observables. So here is our final definition of martingales. Let yk be a stream of observable random variables. For each t, y1, y2, yt is are observed and the sequence of random variables yk is said to be a martingale with respect to observables yk if mk is observable at time k that is mk is a function of m1, m2, m here I should have put again I made a mistake. mk is a function of y1, y2, yk and conditional expectation of mk plus 1 given y1, y2, yk is mk. So, uh, now in, in stochastic process uh, literature, instead of saying observables with respect to a sequence of observables, it will say given a sigma field. And that is something which always bothers uh, others who want to use stochastics in their understanding. They wonder how can a, uh, how can a, what do you mean by given a sigma field? So one has to always read it as given a sequence of observables and that sigma field is sigma field generated by these observables. So any of you who try to read anything in uh, stochastic process in literature, if you just make this transformation that uh, uh, a filtration or a sequence of sigma fields is just a collection of observables. Increasing sigma field means observables are of course increasing. Whatever you observed yesterday you can't undo, you, are, you can only observe more if at all. So sequence of observables is increasing and measurable with respect to sigma field is you can think about it as a function of the observables at that time. All right. So, Martingale is something which is observable at time k and expectation of mk plus 1 given observables up to time k is equal to mk. This is said to be a sub martingale if the equality is replaced by greater than equal to and sub martingale if it is replaced by less than equal to for every k. So this is what is a martingale and uh, And so now, in what follows, we are going to see, fix a stream of observable random variables. And the class of martingales that we talk about is martingales with respect to this sequence of observables. And now you can figure out that the class of martingales becomes a linear space. If you add two martingales, you are going to get a martingale. This may not be true if you are restricting notion as we were discussing earlier. So this property that class of martingales is a linear space will only come when everything we are fixing a stream of observable random variables and our definition of martingales is with respect to this observable stream. Okay. Because here m is a martingale means this and let us say uh, uh, w is a martingale will mean wk is observable at time k it is a function of y1 to yk and Conditional expectation of wk plus 1 given this is equal to wk. So, if you take mk plus 1 plus w plus uh, wk plus 1 and mk plus 1, some of them conditional expectation will be some of the conditional expectations which you will get wk plus mk. So, trivial to work out that the class of martingales becomes a linear space.
And now this is the martingale transform when we are dealing with martingales with respect to some observables. The strategies are also predictable with respect to those observables. And then very easy to verify that uh, the trans it leads you to martingale transform. The transformed object is still a martingale. If M were If M was a sub martingale and FK is non negative, then the corresponding object remains a sub, uh, super martingale, becomes stays super martingale, and sub martingale stays a sub martingale if the multipliers are non negative. So, martingale transforms, transforms a martingale to martingale, but the same transform transforms a sub martingale to a sub martingale if it is non negative value, and transforms super martingale to super martingale if it is again non negative value. Okay, so this is our final definition of a martingale and martingale transform. And now I come to a another interesting notion. Uh, along with martingales, the notion of a stop time, or some authors also call it stopping times. I myself, in writing papers, sometimes have called it stop time and sometimes called it stopping time. It plays an important role in probability theory and its applications. A stop time tau is itself a random variable. It's a function from omega to the time index set such that for each k, there is a function theta k such that the event y tau equal to k is a function of the first k observables. The example that I talked about earlier. Uh, we will start as soon as the number, uh, the participant number goes above 50 or greater than or equal to 50. As soon as it touches 50, we know. So the event that we have to start would depend on uh, y1, y2. If you have to start at time k, it will depend, yes or no, will depend on y1, y2, yk. Or we will stop as soon as the number falls below 20. So that is now a stop time and that again would depend on if yk is the number of people at time k then as soon as yk is less than 20 we will stop. So it is common life it is important we are used to talking about future times which are random but we will know when it happens we will know and everybody will agree that yes it has happened. So here are examples. Total stop first time total exceeds 10, greater than or equal to 10. First case is that sum is greater than or equal to k. First time that you hit 0. And we can always say that if you don't want, you can have infinite sum or you can say stop as soon as this happens or you hit the time 10,000. As soon as you hit 0 or the, you hit the time 100. Uh, Right now, because we wanted to avoid infinities, if you do, can allow infinities in your framework, we need not bring uh, this minimum in mind and then uh, we can follow our usual convention that infimum over in, uh, empty set is infinity. So we can define tau to be infimum k mod y k equal to 0. If no such k occurs, then your tau is equal to infinity. So it depends on whether or not we are allowing infinity in our framework. But so, this morning we have defined these two notions. So, we have a sequence of observables and then a sequence of martingale, sub martingale, super martingale with respect to that observables and now a stop time with respect to the same sequence of observables. When, you will, when time k occurs, if you have not stopped up to then you have come up to time k, then you know whether you should stop or continue. So, while stock market you can say that you know you are aiming for some profit, as soon as the stock price crosses something then you will sell. Next day you sell before the market opens. Okay. 
So this is actually a special case of the Dew's uh, Martingale transform theorem that we talked about. That let tau be a stop time with respect to these observables, and let n k be equal to n k minimum tau. That means you keep moving as long not stop. Once you stop, anyway, nothing changes after that. So your net reward remains whatever. So whatever it was at time tau. So n k is equal to m of k minimum tau. If tau equal to five. Then the sequence n1, n2 will remain become m1, m2, m3, m4, m5, and then m5, 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 m5 dot dot dot. That is our new sequence, which is now we are calling nk. So this is a stopped sequence. So you have a uh, nk was start uh, there to begin with. Now we have stopped it at time tau, and then nk is itself a martingale, and we have already talked about that decision to stop or not depends on up to whatever you have observed. So the same thing can be done. We can now write down a sequence f k with a certain thing I've written down, but you can look at it later that uh, it works. And m tau minimum k is actually just the uh, Martingale transform of m. You can construct this variables f k so that. If you have not got a signal to stop, you will put it as one, and if you have a signal to stop, you put that as zero, and you will get the stop marking there. So, so for a sequence, if tau were three, that will mean that at time one you have to continue, so that these are zero, and at time three you have to stop, so that one is one, and. Uh, So uh, the same proof shows that if m was a submartingale, then after stopping, you are going to get a submartingale because our multipliers are here one or zero, so they are non-negative. So stopping theorem is to begin with. If you have a martingale, this applying stopping theorem, you are going to get martingales. If it is submartingale, you will get a submartingale. If it was supermartingale, you will get a supermartingale. Uh, there may be some typos here, but before I share it with uh, Archana after the sessions, I will correct the typos. I have written some of these slides only last night, so didn't have a way to verify them. So there are some typos. I will correct them. Uh, so um, actually, here is the beauty that since our framework is only a countable probability space. Each of the steps I have written as proof, these are very, actually we can write down them as a very simple observations and very simple proof, simplest algebra possible, simplest linear algebra possible. Okay. Uh, we are not using anything big, big and therefore at one go we are able to do uh, martingale transform, stopping time, the stop martingale result and so on. Okay. And uh, what this means is that if you have a submartingale, then its expected values will keep going down. Uh, so, uh, Here is a major result again due to do. It's called Dube's inequality or Dube's maximal inequality. And suppose Mk is a sub martingale and lambda is positive. Then probability that maximum of Mk is bigger than lambda, maximum taken over k less than or equal to n. Is less than or equal to expect one by lambda expected mn. Very interesting here that the right hand side is as in the Chebyshev inequality for probability that mn is bigger than lambda. Okay, but the same estimate tells you that it is also a, a upper bound for probability that maximum of mk up to k to n 
is bigger than lambda. That probability stays bounded by 1 by lambda times expected mn and other than n occurs only in, as an index of m. You are taking maximum over n terms, but the upper bound doesn't involve how many you are taking maximum of. That is the remarkable part of this theorem. And the proof is extremely simple. Uh, suppose let tau be the stop time which is equal to infimum of k such that mk bigger than lambda minimum n. So you keep observing mk. If you exceed lambda, you stop there. Otherwise, you stop at n in any case. All right. Then probability that the maximum is bigger than lambda is same as m at tau is bigger than lambda. Because if maximum exceeds lambda, if maximum has exceeded lambda at k equal to 5, our tau will be 5 and m of tau will be 5 and m of 5 will be bigger than lambda. So, this probability is same as probability m tau bigger than lambda and now we apply Chebyshev inequality to the or Markov inequality to this, we will get 1 by lambda expected m tau and we already observed that expected m tau is uh, less than or equal to expected m n. So, that becomes 1 by lambda expected m n and that is it. So, this is a very major result and uh, simple calculations that we have done, the proof uh, reduces to just few lines. So, what have been the main ingredients in this result? Uh, that after stopping also the things do not change. Martingale, Martingale, Submartingale, Submartingale. And what is the main part for that? That was this Martingale transform result. Okay. So, uh, these three parts, the Martingale stop times, Martingale transform uh, and now maximal inequality. Okay, uh, this is a remark that with a little more work, we can show the following that mk be a martingale or a positive submartingale. Probability that it is bigger than lambda is this expectation is less than or equal to 1 by lambda expected value described like this. And in turn, it tells us what is called the LP inequality for, uh, for martingales in terms of do that the LP norm of maximum is always less than or equal to the LP norm of the endpoint. Uh, I just made it as a remark. I'm, uh, one can argue this proof, but then we have to write a longer proof. Uh, I prefer this version because this version gets used a lot, lot more by itself. And uh, in any case, this is just three line proof. Little more work and we will get the next one as well.